Hi there, welcome to the show with me, Grayson Salame. Special thanks for your viewership as always. We appreciate each time you tune in. Thank you so much. And like I keep saying, this is a collaborative effort. So hearing from you goes a long way. Share with us what stories you'd like to be seen to highlight. Our details are right below. Now today we um, discuss Lucid D2 a year later. Last year, 15th January 2019, an attack happened that took away many lives and affected many, many others. So with us is a gentleman who happens to be a journalist who was stuck in a washroom, forget this, 12 long hours with six others. So he's going to recount that ordeal with us here today and just take us through what that must have been like. I uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say for the better way or lack of a better way of describing it. Um, so let's begin, and special thanks to our beautiful, beautiful location. This is how you begin a year. Special thanks to Radisson Blue, have to get it right, hotel and residence here in Nairobi, Aboretum. This is gorgeous, so let's start the show. Welcome to Unscripted. Like I said earlier, with me today is a special guest. Silas, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for um, having me. Today, as we begin, I feel like saying Happy New Year yet again, because this is our second episode of the year. And it's only right, um, after what happened last year at Ducet, to just go back in time and have a conversation about it with someone who was there. And we thank God is alive to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, so Silas, uh, my colleague at NTV, you happen to be at Ducet on the 15th of January 2019. Um, take me back to that day, if you could vividly remember your mood, your state. Were you in a good mood? Were you just, oh, like what kind of day is this? You know, in hindsight, sometimes when things happen, you realize, actually, that wasn't a good day for me. How was that day like for you? It was just a normal day, you know, waking up and going to work. Yeah. It was a pretty normal day. Okay. And then it was uh, in the course of my work in the day, somewhere I think around 11 or 10 p.m., I was assigned a story. Uh, of course, a story on the days happening, yeah. you know, the country's spending and the expenditure. So I was supposed to go do an interview with one of the people who was responsible, you know, for, for what was happening. Um, that is the Commission on Revenue Allocation. Okay. Yeah, so I was told to go do the interview. So we call them and then they tell us uh, our offices are at 14 Riverside. Yeah. Uh, you guys come if you want the interview and come let's do the interview. But I was also a bit hesitant to go do the interview. You know, Why? You know, so, somehow my instincts were not, okay. you know. They're not feeling that I wasn't that feeling day. like I need to go do it. Okay. Like I had enough material to execute the story. So there's really no need of, you know, going to do the interview and all that. But they insisted, you know, because TV's bites you know you need True. people to speak you yeah. need images you need all that people to speak so please yeah. speak, speak. Yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. then I, I talked to the guys responsible for organizing logistics yeah. the camera person the car that we use uh, to go to do sleep but then things weren't working right you yeah. know there were delays mm. being told the camera person is not in the driver is not around you know yeah. all that stuff so you're supposed to leave at 12. yeah now, because of these delays, I remember I was supposed to go with Robert Gishira, okay. who was the head of camera yeah. uh, then. But then uh, Gishira later changed, you know, I was supposed now to go with Dixon, because then he had other uh, responsibilities, you know, he's the head of camera, so he has to stay around and yeah. all that. So the journey was just one thing after yeah, another? Yeah, there, there was, you know, one thing after the other, one thing after the other. And then, so we got to do it. We, we got to do it. It was around two. 40 or something. And how was it when you got there? Nothing unusual? It was just usual, you know, the okay. usual check, uh, security checks, you know, getting in and uh, being ushered into the uh, offices where the, the CRA were based. Mm. Then we got in, uh, the person we were in communication with was the communication director for CRA. Okay. So he organizes where we're supposed to do the interview, then calls the CEO and, you know, tells us, you know, you get set up and then I'll bring you the guest. But I think it's the whole process of coming up and setting up this interview that was a bit. What would you advise? What do you think should be done differently at that stage where security is concerned? I think they should be a bit more vigilant. In what way though? Is it equipment in, in, wise? Is it the, the crew itself? Like in what uh, specific ways? 
I think crew-wise, they should be a bit more vigilant in the sense that they should also be told how to respond to certain scenarios or certain situations, because I feel most times they're not prepared for any eventuality. For instance, we have threat alerts yeah, every other yeah. time, but we're not prepared. Yeah, because for instance, I was even talking to a, a friend of mine, and it's a discussion we were having at work. Okay. What would happen if they found you with a gun? Like, what is the what process of confiscating exactly. the gun, and you know, taking you through the whole process? I think we're not very quick. Mm. In, in terms of dealing with such a, such threats, mm. you know, it's it's more of a procedure for us. Let's mm. let's do the security checks in a procedure yeah. way. But so when you got in, um, mm -hmm. what happened, Thomas? So you go in, no more procedures. So the guy who was uh, coordinating the interview, the communication person at CRA. Okay. So he tells us, ah, the CEO is here, he's ready. Mm. So you get set up. You know, we were ushered into their boardroom. Okay told to set up and then we did set up, you know, the necessary things that happened. And then the CEO came. Okay. Uh, so, you know, before you interview someone, then you tell them why you're here. Of course. You know, we here to interview you about this and this and this, yeah. you know. Uh, and the questions we want you want to answer okay. are based on this and this and this. Okay. So we're doing the briefs, you know, as he's prepared. Uh, the camera guy was miking him up. Okay. And then, before we could start, you know, before you could shoot my first question, yeah. we had a big, loud explosion, mm. which somehow shook the entire building. You know? nice. And then there were a few gunshots. At that so point? At that point, I was not aware of what was happening. You know, I just sat Did in you, my seat. Did anyone know what was that noise? What's going on? Did any of Nobody you... knew. I think we hadn't figured out what it was. Yeah. So then the guy, uh, who is the CEO of CRA, is like, uh, guys, I think we need to figure out what what is happening before you know we continue. The same was said by Dixon, who was a camera person. But me, by that point, I was still, you know, because clueless about what was happening, yeah. about, you know, this is, we are under attack or something. So before we could figure out exactly what was the first explosion, we mm. had the second one. The second one was a bit mild compared to the first one. Yeah. But then the gunshots were now more sporadic. So then you knew something So that's when it was like, on. you know, yeah, I think I think we, we need to stop this and figure things out. Before anything, everyone had run out of the room. Yikes. You know, uh, including the CEO. Flight. Yeah, the need is, let's run. So everyone ran out of the room. So we were left, you know, me and Dixon trying to, you know, get our equipment out, you know. just, you just left you guys with your stuff. Yeah, everyone <laughs> left because the first instincts, let's Save run. Save your life, you know, yeah. And stuff. So and you're trying still to... thinking, get my equipment and go. Mm. Look at that, the life of a journalist. Dixon was thinking of that. Me, I wasn't thinking of that yet. Okay. I was still, you know, clueless about, you know, how to respond, how to react. I think I, I panic first, you know, when things happen, I, I get to panic before then I can figure out. So, I went and peeped out of the window. Mm -hmm. I think we were on fourth floor or something. So, when I peeped out downstairs, I saw people running. So, I was like, guys, I think, and I think this is serious, so let's, let's get out. So, Dixon grabs the camera. And the tripod. Okay. I grabbed the camera bag and then we ran out. Right. So we ran uh, and then went to the staircase. Okay. You know, there we met like a group of guys also, trying you know, to trying escape. to find, Safety. you know, the exit and run out of the building. Yeah. So you know, there's a bit of a commotion there. You know, everyone we trying okay. to figure out how we should go out. But still, people are also still figuring out what exactly is happening. Is it robbery? Exactly. You know, or is it like yeah. a terrorist attack? So. Something strange happened when we were at the staircase. What? So Dixon, uh, his journalistic instincts kicks in. He's like, we need yeah, to so he's this. like, uh, Silas, can you hold this tripod for me? I shoot, you know, maybe I can get exclusive pictures of this whatever robbery thing, you know, uh. whatever is happening. So I get hold of the tripod and the camera bag. And then he starts, you know, filming. Yeah. But I think before he could frame his shot, there was another gunshot. This time it was a bit louder because I think it's maybe the guy was closer, you know, to us. What did that do to you guys? I still froze. You know, all this time I was... You're not autopilot. My mind, I hadn't wrapped yeah. my mind around, you know, what's happening. So I still froze. Dixon rain. you know, everyone now was scampering for safety. Guys, I think it's serious, let's, you know, let's run. There was a bit of stampede on the staircase, mm. you know. Uh, then Dixon decides to run for the elevator. 
Thank God the elevator crazy. did not, you know, yeah. open and stuff. I don't know what would have happened had he gone, like, downstairs. gone downstairs. He would have probably met one of them in the entrance. Yeah. So it is at that point, I think, when everyone was running, that I came to my senses, you know, and realized that this is serious. I need mm. to find safety. Were you scared? Were you terrified? Were you... I wasn't scared at that point. I was just interested in knowing how to be safe. You know, my interest was, let, let me find safety first, then I can figure out what figure is out happening. Rest. So there was a door that was leading to, you know, some free hall or some, some space that was under renovation. Yeah. So we all ran in there. So when we were in there, we found it. This is an open space, you know, we can see here. Mm. So then we saw another opening, which I likely was leading to the washrooms. So we ran to the washrooms. And then we lock ourselves in. I think we were like four or five people. Wow. So when, once we'd locked ourselves in, something, a lot of something interesting also happened. Uh, What's going on? We had some commotion, you know, on the roof yeah. of, of the sailing of the washroom. Someone was trying to gain access. I think that's And at this point, you don't us. know whether this someone is someone looking for safety or one of the bad guys. If I could yeah, that. and, and, and that's, that's, I think that's the, 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 the debate. I think that's the most, the scariest part because yeah. you don't know who the person was. Was it one of the attackers or whatever? But the first, I think, thought that came to us was, you know, this is an attacker coming in, mm. trying to get access. What so did you do? We all ran out again. Back into the unsafe. Back into the... Open space. Free open space that was under renovation. I think it was an office kind of place. Yikes. So when we got there, I think one of the attackers who was now in the hotel or the entrance of the hotel saw mm -hmm. you know, the, the people there. So he shot. That again sent us back into the space we were running away from. And but this time, we were lucky enough. We decided to go into the first cubicle. You okay. know, the second one. Because the second one had, had, had proved a bit unsafe. Welcome back to Inscripted. Thank you so much for staying with us. Special thanks to Radisson Blue Hotel and Residence here at Nairobi Arboretum. And you can hear the water in the background. Yes, that's a beautiful ambiance of this place. Um, Silas, thank you so much for um, just sharing your experience with us. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine what that must have felt like. You said you froze. I have no idea what state I would have been in in that moment. Um, mm -hmm. Before the break, you told us you are now looking for safety, scampering for safety, and seven of you found yourselves in a washroom. How was that 12-hour ordeal being in that washroom? No, 12 hours is a long time. A long time. You know, I, th I think at some point I lost count. I only checked the clock after being, you know, we'd been rescued. Yeah. And I was like, you know, it's 12 hours. So how are you even fitting? Explain to us that cubicle setting. How was, yeah, and what state were you in, all mm -hmm. seven of you? It was, I think there's a bit of confusion, you know, there was a bit of, it was also tense. Because mm. you also a don't know of, what's happening. Yeah, yet. It's you not don't clear. know what, what is happening outside. Mm. You know, you don't have a communication with the outside world yeah. other than your phone. Yeah. So it was a bit tense, you know, the moment, and you know, there was uh, gunshots, we could hear gunshots mm. everywhere, also punctuated by a bit of silence. Yeah. So then you don't know what exactly is happening, a police, as the police arrived or mm. something. So when you got there, uh, the washroom, uh, the first cubicle, I think we were like seven people. Yeah. Uh, most of them were staff members of the CRA, okay. you know, who had come to uh, find uh, But the CEO was not one of them. Yeah. The CEO was not there. The CEO, I think, I suspect he had gone to his office, okay. you know. He, had, he, had <laughs> he felt safe. Yeah, yeah, he felt safe in his office. So we were like seven people. The most prominent person I think we had in that cubicle was one of the commissioners of the CRA. I see. Uh, Professor Yugi. Yes. He was some old, nice, old guy. You, know, you described guy, very, so. in, in much detail in your blog, how that was like. Yeah, it was, so Professor. when he got in, you know, everyone was getting in and then there's yeah. this panic and all that. Of and given his age, you know, advanced age, and, yeah. you know, I much respect to him. Of course. Uh, you know, he was breathing a bit heavily, which is quite... Uh, alarming of, for the rest yeah, of us. Yeah, alarming you. for the rest of us. You know, yeah. some of us are like, oh, please, you know, just, just, <laughs> just keep it cool, you know. We, otherwise, things may not be good for us. Just keep it cool. Were there ways to calm him down? Like, did his colleagues know how to... Nobody knew. Uh, 
first of all, I did not know that he's a prof, like he's, he's a commissioner of the CRA. When I saw him and he started breathing, I was like, uh, you know, this is going to be a bit of a problem. So is it okay if we like ex excused him and, you know, told him to go somewhere else or something? You said that? Or you I was thought that? De debating in my mind. <laughs> okay. Until, you know, one of the people we were with, you know, called him prof. And, you know, like, that's when I figured, you know, he's quite an important guy. So the next uh, most possible move, because I was seated on the toilet seat, you know, it was the safest. And where were the other Away people? from the door. The others were like standing on the edges. Okay. So I was told to vacate my seat for him. I was like, oh man, you guys can do this too. As you should for any older elderly yeah, person. Yeah, but Silas. then, you know, we were looking for safety. Everyone was like, <laughs> you know, we need to be safe and all that stuff. Yeah. But then I left. The reason why I was hesitant to leave was because the most of the, the only available space was us facing the door you know, you know the, i would stand facing the door and i thought that would be a bit more riskier I see. Having but to, that was the know, only space you had now but that is the only space i had yeah, so out of my respect for him you know i just left uh, the seat for him and he sat and i think it's then that it started calming down okay. and cooling you know and, it, and is. it was quite much of a relief you know for us but I have to ask, in that moment, um, like you mentioned, that uh, the CEO was probably by himself somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I know of a, another, someone I know was also in a washroom somewhere down there, all mm -hmm. by himself. Mm -hmm. Is there some solace or strength or hope in numbers? Or in that moment, because of maybe the prof breathing or, oh my gosh, I have to stand here because... Did you want to be out of there or did you feel safer with other people? I think it was a bit safer with other people. Okay. Because then you know that you are not in this alone. Mm. You know, there's the solace that comes with people sending you messages and calling you and telling you, you know, hold on, be strong, yeah. it's going to end soon. There's a solace in that. But having people, I think for me, was more comforting, yeah. you know, than the messages that I was receiving. Because yeah. then you are like, I'm not trapping this all by myself. That's I have true. people that... We're going the same, through the same experience. We're going through the same experience. And they're probably feeling even worse than I am feeling, mm. you know? And the fact that we can see each other and just look at each other, even without talking, that, that I think in a sense it was a bit comforting. Yeah. And it was more of like a solace. And for, I'm trying to wrap my mind around 12 hours. So I'm guessing there's no talking because yeah. you don't want to make a noise. Mm -hmm. Um, someone wants to use the word, help themselves, sorry, you've got to so stick it through. Funny enough, yeah. so there's this person who decides to flush the toilet in the other washroom, which I think sent us into further panic. What, you know, we're like, do? can you please keep quiet? Why are you trying to inform these guys that there's someone inside here, you know? But nothing happened. And then happened. someone uh -huh. also decided to run the water in the wash Washing area. That? You know, oh, I was no. like... Please, even if you're washing your face or something, just don't do it now. It's you know, yeah, you're just, just, <laughs> or just stay as yeah, you are. like we're all suffering. You know, some of us are sweating inside here, and we <laughs> just decided to keep quiet. You know, oh, so every slight noise, you know, there are people who are mumbling prayers. You know, you could hear someone say a prayer. I think at some point I had one make a phone call. I think to the wife or something. You know, and saying, you know, pray for us yeah. and all that. If something happens, you know, know that I love you and all those kind of things. It was a bit touching, yeah. you know, and, and the fact that you're in a place and you don't know where you're going to die, but somehow you tell yourself you may make it out. But I think the most, the scariest of it was you don't know the way out, mm. you know, and, and for you, you sit there knowing it's just a matter of minutes or hours or seconds before one of them storms in or a grenade is thrown at you or something and you know see that what happen. you just said you don't know it's just a matter of time before impending death yeah so did you think that was the day you're going to die silas i i somehow thought so you know i somehow mm -hmm. thought and i was telling myself i don't think i've lived enough to do the things i wanted to do you know so what thoughts I, run through your head your mind specifically the first was, this is not how I want to die. Mm. You know, I don't want to die in this situation. Like, let me die in another way, not, mm. not, not, not with someone shooting, shooting me or dying in a place I have no control or like in a circumstance that I have no control about. So I knew I was going to die. 
you know, but I just did not know when. You, know, you didn't know at what hour, at what, or what moment. hour, you know, what moment. That's but then I was, I was like, even if I do, I think I'll die the saddest person because I haven't, you know, done the things I wanted to do with my life. I haven't made amends with certain things that I think I had yeah. messed around with. I hadn't yeah. interacted with the people I wanted to interact with. Yeah. So it is very scary to me. I can imagine. You know, and I think it also happened at a time I, I hadn't said a prayer in a long time. Really? So did you pray at that moment? I did. Oh, good. I, I don't know. I knew I had done a few wrongs, you know, yeah. and my prayer was like, you know, God, if I die, don't send me to hell, you know? So I have to ask this. I like what you said. And you'll see this happening in people. It could be sickness. It could be uh, a tragedy or trauma situation like you went through, um, an accident, whatever, where we remember God. Um, and for you, I have to ask, did that sort of convict you today, Silas Today 2020, to sort of remember him more regularly? I or did you, like, what, what have you changed about your life since that experience? I think I'm more self-aware right now. I'm, I'm aware of my emotions. I'm aware of my being. I'm aware of the, the fact that there's a more higher power, you know, than you know, whatever we can think about, yeah. you know, that you are, the reason why you are alive is because of a reason, you know, you're just mm -hmm. not alive without anything. There's purpose. So there's a purpose, there's a reason why mm -hmm. you, you're still breathing today. Yeah. And that, that breath can be taken away anytime, you know, and, and so it's, it's, it's right to do things when you're supposed to do them. It's, it's, Important to build relationships that are important when you're supposed yep. to build them, when you still have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Nurture good relationships, you know, build yourself, invest yeah. in yourself. Go after the dreams that you... Go after the things you want to go for, yeah. you know. And, and most importantly, live a life of purpose, I think. Yeah. I think that for me is what I do what every triggered. day from now. Good. You know, I think it's triggered that. Because you realize it's, it's bigger than the now. But it's bigger what than are you the leaving now. behind? What yeah. legacy? And, and, and the thing is, I don't think I want to be caught unaware. You know, when, when the, my day would come, I would be like, you know, I don't regret having lived a meaningless life. Of course. You know, at least I did some things that are more add value, you know, are meaningful in my yeah. life. So I think that's the awareness that I, I live with every day, that I need to make every day count in whatever yes. small way it yeah. is. So, the whole thing, I, I think it, I don't think there's anyone who goes through that and comes out the same. With the same. Your perspective changes in a way, you know. Besides the trauma that, yeah. that, that comes with it, I think your attitude towards life, you know, your outlook towards life changes. And mine changed, you it know. Did. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it, it changed, you know, it does change. Welcome back to Inscripted. Um, now, before the break, Silas, you were just describing to us how when you go through such an experience, you never cannot come out the same person. So if I ask you today, what does life mean to you? I think I attribute life to, you know, purpose. Would I say purpose? Or like, yeah. I want to live a more meaningful life, okay. you know, a life that either impacts other people's lives positively or leaves an impact wherever I am in a sense, and that's my attitude every day. You in know? everything you're doing. And everything I do. That's good. I, I'm a bit cautious also towards, you know, uh, doing certain things, you know, cautious in the sense that I weigh my options. Is it worth it? Got it. You know? Got it. You don't just make a decision I, on a whim. Yeah. You think it, through yeah, it. I think through it. Is it really worth it? You know, what are the benefits of doing whatever I'm supposed to do, whatever I want to do? So. I think my outlook and my perspective in life has completely changed. Has changed. And it's a journey. It's a journey, I yeah, think. I think. Yeah, of course. There's no pressure of by this time I should have been here or I should be here. Yeah. I think it's it's an ongoing daily process. Yeah. Yeah. Of but then also you, you, you tell yourself that yeah. you can never dictate life. Mm. You know, you can never predict what is gonna happen. You can never you never know what's gonna happen in the next two seconds or in the next two minutes. Sometimes it's just important to live life, you know. And then as long as you're living it right, yeah. just just live it. 
so I know Red Cross offered counseling and um, you know therapy after. Did you take it up and how was that like for you? I did not take the Red Cross one. Oh, you, I you did one that Nation offers. Oh, so this one that is offered by Nation. So I did. Did that help the healing journey? Mm. Yeah, I did. Because then I think you need someone to help you process your thoughts, you know. And I think that is what I needed myself. Someone then would help me like process my thoughts because I find it pretty hard, you know, expressing myself and sitting down with someone to tell them, you know, this is what is going through my mind and all that stuff. So I probably need a professional, you know, to you know help me Put process those together. thoughts. But come well. to terms with certain... And you certain, write very well. Yeah. So. And also write about it, because I think writing comes natural to me. Okay. Write about it and see how it goes. So I did do therapy, but it's still, you know, it's a journey. You, you, don't, you don't recover from it in an instant. It's, it's something that you keep working on. So I, I think the other thing that this whole experience taught me is that it's never wrong to look for help. That's true. You know? Because I think as men, sometimes mm. we, the society has taught us to be masculine, no. you know. Be tough, don't. Be tough, you know, ma a man bottles up his emotions, yeah. they don't say their problems. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons why we have so many problems in the True. society, you know, because we don't it's speak about them. Mm. So we end up manifesting them in ways and projecting them to people who don't it's even true. deserve it, who we are not part of the problem. People. Exactly. So I am exactly. learning, I think the other big lesson I'm learning is to seek help when I need it, Good. you know, to seek someone to speak to when I need to speak about things, okay. not to bottle things up. Because I've had instances where I have had to project certain emotions to people who did not deserve it, I see. you know, because then I did not deal with them. Okay. I've had experiences where I have people project, you know, their mm. emotions or their issues to other people. And they didn't you know, have so to. I think that also is my biggest takeaway. You it know, is. Because you're also aware of that because of the therapy, mm -hmm. you can now spot when you're acting out of line or someone yeah. is acting out of line, which is, I think, everyone um, is something you need to learn. Mm -hmm. Given a chance today, mm -hmm. um, if you could talk to the assailants who did what they did, what would you tell them? I, first of all, I know this is strange, or this would come out as, I mean, this would sound strange. What? Oh. But I, I wouldn't want to. I, I think they're doing those things because they believe mm. in the things they do. The right because someone doing. had indoctrinated, you know, had, had like planted those in them. You know, yeah. like someone had them. radicalized them or yep. brainwashed them into thinking that whatever they do is, you know, for a higher calling, mm. for a higher cause. And it's sometimes it's very hard to engage somebody as such. You know, somebody in that mind. Yeah. That space of mind. That's true. They wouldn't probably see sense in your argument, so it sounds in your. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I think if we learn to tolerate one another, you know, like the universe has a lot for everyone, like enough for everyone. I think it's this struggle for power mm. and control and the greed, you know, yeah. that leads to all this. Yeah. If we just came to the understanding that. I don't need to harm somebody else, you exactly. know, to, to get my way. I That's don't need true. to step on somebody to get my way. Because, I mean, there's enough for you. God created you and, you know, put everything to your disposal. It's just you to work for it and work towards it without undermining the other person. Okay. So the moment we learn how to tolerate one another, I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop having these problems. I realized that I forgot to finish the part where you're in the room, the cubicle, so the minute you guys left, it was 10 p.m.? It uh, was finally when... When they rescued when they us. were rescued. It was at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Tell we me about that at, moment, the rescue moment. We got in at 3 p.m. towards 4, and then the rescue happened, I think, 3 a.m. towards 4 a.m. as well. It's crazy. So what happened is, at some minutes towards midnight, uh, the light went off. Mm. The entire building was shut down. Our AC stopped working, oh, so no. it was a bit damp. You know, more down. <laughs> the road. So, uh, and then we knew that maybe now it's time they're coming for us. Yep. Because I that think was we, indication yeah, we've we already time. given up hope. You know, you know what, guys? I think we'll stay here till morning. Whatever happens, you know, maybe they'll have killed all their assailants and then we'll 
just mm -hmm. walk out free. So at this point, it, it changed. You believed you were going to make it out. We Before believed. You thought yeah, we this believed was it. we were gonna be we were gonna get out. I think it was towards midnight or midnight or thereabout. Okay. But then it was taking like ages for them to reach us. Yeah. So we were like, Mom, you know, we're just gonna sit in the darkness. Whatever happens, almost all our phones had died. You know. I can imagine. So you don't yeah. even know how to communicate. Yeah. And yeah, then it time went. You know, minutes. I mean, seconds to minutes, minutes to hours. You know, and you know, time went, went by, went by. And then I think it's towards three now that then we had a commotion, you know, someone trying to break into our door. Did you panic or did you think, yay, finally? We'd made peace there... with it at that point. Oh. We had made peace, you know, whatever, whatever happens, happens. Wow. But this is what we're going to do. Everyone is going to fight for their lives. If he gets in and you, you're the first person to spoil them or something, just do whatever you can, you know. I mean, we'll do the damage control or whatever later on. So whatever happens, happens. Oh, wow. But then, after the noise, we had them shouting, police, police, police. So we were like, oh, God, thanks. But again, we're not opening the door yet, you know, until they come and identify themselves properly. Okay. So they went knocking into other doors, you know, and getting guys out. Yeah. So something interesting happened in our, in our place of hiding. What happened? Guys were in the wash area. One, I, I don't know if you do, they were nervous or they were like, relieved that you know help us come <laughs> why what happened so before we could agree all of us you know that guys let's wait yeah they decided to open the door out of excitement yeah so we're here. I, I don't know if it was excitement or the relief, relief yeah. they just opened the door were like you know what that was in the yeah, agreement that was in the arrangement you know <laughs> but then we were lucky that, that the you stick up or you stick to oh, the you, plan you have to stick to your plan okay. you know otherwise any mistake may be fatal you know but so, how was that moment for you, knowing that finally we're uh, out? Yeah, I was like, feel? when I go, I was like, yeah, there's, I think the reason why I won't die is because I need to do a few things right. So I was like, yeah, it's time I, you know, made right your wrongs, right my wrongs and all that stuff. So oh. it was quite a relief, first of all, you know, that yes. finally I am out, yeah. we are out. Of course, when we, we got out and then we went and sat in some central place, you know, yeah. before they got everyone in the floor out. Okay. Then I saw Dixon, I was like, man, oh, you were here. You too. You know? yeah. was like, so where was he? In a separate... I learned that he was in the next, I you know, see. he was in the adjacent, you know, okay. but on a different uh, room. Okay. So I was like, ah, oh, man, you're here. So you're like, oh, man, thank God. Thank God. So you're ushered out, and then we were taken to, out of the building, you know. Uh, uh, to... Did you say a prayer? I did. A thank you, prayer? I did. Oh, I said, you know, this is... This is what thanking God I'm alive. Amen. All of us mumbled a few prayers here and there. I'm sure. Yeah, and then we walked out. What's the first thing you did when either you got home? Like, what's the, what is the first thing you wanted to do? To just be like, oh. I wanted to go home. I just, I didn't know how my phone it had died. So a friend of mine called a cab for me. Okay. And then I went home. Who were you communicating with while you were in there? I was communicating. Was, was critical for you to let them know this is a situation? A colleague at work. Who are, I was in constant communication with. I wasn't really big on communication as well because really? I. It didn't help you knowing what's happening. I. It didn't in a in a way because because yeah. then I I was like, you know, it, this is going to make me panic even more. You know, I would rather just communicate when necessary or when something strange happens or when so something unusual happens. See... I did. Okay. Of course, now everyone was you? sending their tweet feeds yeah. and all that. What's happening? I do see it. Someone sent us a, f a picture the police had arrived. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't very big on communication, I think, because then it would make me more panicky. So okay. I was like... Okay. But then, I mean, there are people who are consistent, you know, tell us what is happening, you know, talk I to us. Imagine. So then I would, I, would, I, would, I would talk back. But I was not big on it. Um, so I guess as we finish up, how are you one year later? How is Silas? I'm all right. Yeah? I... I I wouldn't say that I'm a hundred percent, but I think I am very okay right now. I find found a professional way of dealing with, with my issues. I've found friends, I've found healthy relationships that then help me, you know, have a positive outlook towards life. So I am not as bad as it ought to have been, yeah. you know. But I think I'm also in a good space. Um, most self aware right yes. now. I like that I'm pretty much aware of 
the things I'm supposed to do, you know. I am very, pretty much selective as well, you know, yeah, on, on, okay. on what exactly I should and should not do. But I, but I think I'm in a safe space right now. In a good space. I'm, I'm, I'm in a good space. Um, High five that. Thank you so much. Trying to get better. Trying to get better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming to share your story. Mm -hmm. Please write. Like, keep writing. Are always we? and always. And I don't know if I can plug in where he writes, but just look for him. Mm -hmm. um, you're an amazing writer. And that's where we saw your story. And I just had to meet you and hear it from you. All right. Um, we thank God for your life. And um, the group of people who made it out, we are grateful. We thank God. I must ask, because mm -hmm. I'm in my head, because, you know, we've just seen this in movies. I'd imagine... In such a situation, do you form a bond? Like, do you talk to these guys now? Do you talk to Prof? Do you know if he's okay or no? I, I think I should look for Prof. You One should. of these days, I should look for him. You Probably should. even send him a link so that you can see how he described him. Exactly. In the or I even will. the show. I'll send you the link, then yeah. you could yeah. send it I'll, to him. Hi, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look for him. You'll have to. Yeah. The others, I've met one person, okay. you know, the communication guy who was helping us with the interview. Oh, good. But we haven't met all of us. I think we. We went separate in one way or the other. Life has been busy, so we yes. haven't really hooked up. So. Would you go back to do it? Never. Never. I don't think I would want to go. I would not say never, you know. I My know. work may take me there anyway. But I don't think I would willingly want to go back for now. I would, I, would, I would want to, you know, deal with it fast and, you know, maybe we'll eventually go back. But I, I haven't... I know. seen myself going back there yet. Yeah. And it makes um, the healing journey is, is not black and white. And um, so I, I'm just grateful that mm -hmm. you, you're talking about it, the healing, you're dealing with it um, in the best way you can. And you're here sharing the story. So anyone who's watched and has gotten nuggets from this brave young man, um, please do reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you loved about it what more you'd love to see on this show. We appreciate your viewership and your feedback. Special thanks to Radisson Blue Hotel, residents Nairobi, Aboretum. Beautiful, beautiful ambience. Until next week, good night and God bless. Bye.